Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Foothills United Methodist Church. We're glad that you have joined us for this morning of worship together, both in person and online. Let's begin this morning by greeting our friends and loved ones who have gathered with us today. As you see on the screen before you and on the altar, our flowers are given today uh, by Cindy Craft Shuren Brown in uh, memory of Dottie Jenkinson, who we are remembering after one year of her passing, and our uh, prayers continue to be with uh, Don. Uh, as we move forward, want to let you know of a few things going on in the life of the church that may be of interest of you, and we invite you to participate in. Uh, first, our coffee hour this morning is being sponsored by a small group, uh, Women in Transition. And uh, in addition, if you want to know more about that group, uh, you can check with them at, on the patio between the services. But also, uh, an invitation for you uh, if to form small groups, to be in small groups, to be part of that as part of your faith journey. And if there's anything that Pastor Christy and I can do to help resource that, we're happy to do so. Okay, you'll find a table outside as well following the service for Boots and Bling, and it's coming up quickly. Uh, Saturday, October 22nd is the date uh, at the Ronald Reagan's Community Center in El Cajon. Uh, dinner and auction, both live auction and silent auction. Uh, we continue to welcome the, the donation of gift cards or other items for our silent auction. Uh, live auction is set. And most importantly, if you haven't purchased tickets yet, please do so by this Friday, October the 14th, because we need an accurate count. So if you haven't purchased tickets, please do so either in person or online uh, this week. Okay, as we move into October, obviously we're into Halloween, and uh, we... Uh, are going to be hosting one of our big events on campus, our community outreach of Trunk or Treat. Uh, this is when we have uh, members of the church and members of the community uh, decorate the trunks of their cars and vehicles out on the front parking lot, dress up, decorate, and we welcome lots of kids from our Faith Academy preschool as well as the community who come to Car to Car. So, We'd love for you to help with this. You can see Lisa Stewart, who is in charge of our children and family ministries, who coordinates this event. We need people to decorate their trunks and to help give out candy uh, and help in a variety of ways that day. Uh, or just to participate by bringing your own kids or grandkids as well. So mark your calendars October 30th. It'll be on the front lawn and in the front parking lot. I think it's time for our video now, Pastor Christy. Good morning, friends. So I just wanted to um, explain uh, before we watch the video, so what are we doing, right? Maybe you um, have kind of missed when we explained this. So for our children's time, we have created a special video series called Where's Pastor Christy? And during this time, each week, I try to locate things on our campuses that may somehow, and this is really challenging, let me tell you, somehow connect to our worship theme or our sermon's message. Okay, so today's is, is an easy one, okay? But I hope that you enjoy it and... Um, I hope you play along each week as you try to guess where I am. Hi, friends. 
friends. I think you know where I am today, but I have a different question for you. Do you know what this is? Is it a frisbee? Maybe a hat? No, it's an offering plate. Some of you remember what this is, but some of you may not have seen one of these before. This is an offering plate that we use to pass to one another during worship to collect the gifts given to the church. Now this is our offering plate with our phone or our computer that can set up our giving electronically, which we appreciate very much, by the way. Some still like to give by cash or check, and so we have an offering basket in the narthex ready to receive your gifts. But what happens after it goes into the basket? We have designated people who take your gifts to the church office to give to our finance managers who count your gifts and deposit them. Do you know how to get to the church office? Well, follow me and I will show you how to get there. We've arrived here at the church office and through these doors you'll find the offices of our finance managers. They are good and just stewards of the church's money. Today we'll be reading the parable of the unjust steward or the um, dishonest money manager who basically cooked the books and got caught. Then he spent so much time and energy trying to undo what he had already done. And so the manager's boss said, imagine all the good that you could have done if you used that same time and energy spent on doing the right thing the first time. Well, the gospel doesn't quite say it this way, but I imagine that this is one of the lessons that this parable teaches, that it's better just to be honest and do the right thing the first time. I know our financial managers spend a lot of time and energy doing the right thing as good stewards of the church's gifts. So if you have any questions, feel free give them a call. Before we uh, go into our worship time even further, we have a birthday today. <laughs> so it's Pastor Greg's birthday. Anybody else's birthday today? Let's sing to Pastor Greg. Thank you very much. I am very introverted, if you didn't know that or not, on the inside. So, But it's wonderful being serenaded by the choir. Thank you very much, and all of you. as you are able and join me in the call to worship, followed by the hymn of praise. O oh God, we come into your courts with praise and thanksgiving. We come in celebration and sorrow. We come in gratitude of your inheritance. We come as those who have received blessings upon blessings. 
O oh God, we come into your courts with praise and thanksgiving. We come in celebration and song. Please join me in the affirmation. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. We come to our time of prayer, and from our faith community, we lift up Joyce McKinnon as she prepares for knee replacement surgery on Tuesday. Prayers for a calm spirit beforehand and for successful surgery with optimum recovery. And we have a prayer quilt today for Judy Bahura, friend of Diana Steiner, who is uh, experiencing difficult family issues. So I invite you to stop by the quilt that will be in the narthex this morning to tie a knot and say a prayer for wisdom, strength, and reconnection for Judy and her son. And if you are worshiping online, we invite you to tie virtual knots with your prayers. So the chancel choir will now lead us in this time of prayer.
ever patient God. You are so patient with us, and we thank you. We take our eyes off you, and we entertain bonehead ideas and get lured in by Ponzi schemes, all for the chance to accumulate more for ourselves. We messed up the moment we took our eyes off you, and we confess we do that more than we like to admit. We feel as if we have to live by the world's rules if we want to survive in this world. Yet you remind us that anything of this world will not last. It is all temporary here. Serving you with our whole selves is how we receive true riches. So forgive us when we spend too much time and energy manipulating the system for our own benefit or for being complicit with the system when it benefits us. Forgive us when we don't admit when we're wrong. Forgive us when we don't take responsibility for our actions. It is in your forgiveness that we can forgive ourselves and we can forgive those who have pulled a fast one on us or we have, you, have been used for their benefit. We come to you with our hearts full of gratitude and we also come with heavy hearts, weighed down by sickness, grief, anxiety, anger, confusion, frustration, and hunger. So we pause for silent prayer and meditation as we offer to you whatever is on our hearts this morning. We hunger for you, O God. We hunger for your healing grace to heal the wounds caused by this world. Evil is running rampant with wars continuing, greed that bankrupts humanity and the earth, and unspeakable violence upon sleeping children and families. The lack of compassion and disregard for human life has caused deep wounds that only your love can heal. We pray for those in the throes of grief, for victims of trauma, for those suffering from illness of any kind, and for those who don't see any way forward. Pour your life-giving peace upon them to show them you are with them, and you will show them the way. We bring our hungers to you. We bring our heartaches to you. We bring our hang-ups and our habits that keep us focused on ourselves instead of focused on you. Help us. Help us to open our hearts with compassion even in the face of evil. Show us how to live the way of love in a world that so desperately needs it. Thank you for bringing us here to this moment of worship and for being present with us. So we close this time of prayer by singing together the prayer that Jesus taught.
This morning's scripture is the parable of the dishonest manager. Then Jesus said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager and charters were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, what will I do now that my manager, my master is taking the position away from me? I am not strong enough to dig and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that when I am dismissed as manager, people will welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, how much do you owe my master? He answered, a hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 50. Then he asked another, how much do you owe? And he replied, a hundred containers of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and make it 80. And the master commended the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of dishonest wealth so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into their eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust you with the true riches? And if you have not been faithful what, with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. The word of God for the people of God. Oh, 
So Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of those gathered together be acceptable unto you, O Lord, our Rock and Redeemer. Amen. So in our scripture today from the Gospel according to Luke, we have one of the thorniest parables that Jesus shares. As Pastor Christie mentioned, it's often called the parable of the dishonest manager or the unjust steward. But I'm going to call it today the parable of the shrewd manager because that's what Jesus says about it. And let's try to figure out why by diving a little deeper into it. Now you heard Leah read so well the parable itself, but just to recap briefly, you have a manager who has been put in charge of an estate of a wealthy owner. And you need to know that this was a common practice in the time of Jesus, that a landowner would promote one of his servants to be the steward or manager. And the expectation was that this person would manage all of the affairs of the estate. That included things like collection of rents or debts from the other servants. Now, the manager would make money by adding their commission on top of what was owed the master. So, if, for example, if a worker owed 50 denarii to the landowner, the manager might add another 20 for his cut. And I know this is difficult in a 21st century context to even put into our heads because obviously we don't accept practices like slavery and indentured servanthood anymore, but that is the context for this parable and we have to understand those relationships in order to understand what's going on here. Now you heard how this particular manager is a bad one, that he has squandered his master's assets. So, of course, the master fires him and demands that he present all the financial records for an audit. And that's when the manager says, well, what am I going to do? He says, I'm not strong enough for manual labor. I'm too ashamed to beg, but I've got to make a living somehow. So he comes up with this plan. And his plan is to make allies of those who owe debts to the master so that he has some place to land, some relationships to depend upon after he is dismissed by the master. Calls them in, one by one. And as you heard, you did it so well, Leah, thank you. <laughs> he asks what they owe. And when uh, they tell him, he cuts it. The, 50 ju the 100 jugs of oil becomes 50. 100 containers of wheat becomes 80. Now, there's a debate among commentators about whether the manager is just getting rid of his own commission and still paying all that is owned to the master, which is a viable one, or is just even being more dishonest and taking some away from the master. But regardless, he's giving them a break. He's forgiving them of some of their debts so that they will welcome him when he's unemployed into their homes. So here comes the surprising part of the parable, right? The landowner learns what the manager has done, and what does he do? He commends him for his shrewdness and quick action. He's not upset by the manager's dealings. He's, he's impressed by his resourcefulness. So what is Jesus trying to teach his disciples and us with this parable? Is it look out for yourself when the going gets tough? Act fast before the window of opportunity closes, even if it's morally questionable? It's a hard one. So I'm going to hang my hat on the next line. I think it's the key to interpreting this parable. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful, faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, 
who will entrust to you the true riches? We find ourselves, of course, with certain possessions in life. Sometimes very little, sometimes a lot. And the central issue is not about how much we have, but how faithful we are with what God has given us. How we share what we have is the key to the message that Jesus is giving to his disciples. Now, our founder, John Wesley, was very practical. And back in 1760, he preached a very practical sermon on this parable entitled, The Use of Money. And he outlined three very simple steps of what God is calling us to do with what has been given to us. The first, Wesley says, is gain all you can. Now, it's important to note that he says that there are certain conditions with this, to do it honestly and wisely, to not cause harm to others or ourselves. To gain all we can while following the great commandment, to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbor as ourselves. The second is save all you can. And John Wesley lived out this his entire life. We know that from his very detailed journeys. He, he lived on very little and gave away most that he had. The third, after those first two, of gain all you can and save all you can, is give all you can. Why? Because Wesley says this in his own words. When God brought you into being and placed you in this world, he placed you here not as a proprietor, but as a steward. And as such, he entrusted you for a season with goods of various kinds. But the sole property of these still rest in him, nor can ever be alienated from him. In other words, God continues to be the owner of all of these assets, and we have been granted them for a certain time and space. And God's command is that we use those blessings, that those assets, those incomes, wisely on behalf of others. It's not enough just to work hard and be thrifty, according to Wesley. There's a moral requirement that we share these gifts of God generously. And an essential part of our Christian discipleship is to recognize that all that we have, money, property, body, mind, and spirit, those are gifts from God. And therefore are ultimately returned to God. That we are simply the stewards of them for our time One of my favorite movies is Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. And I'm not talking about the 2005 version. Everybody said no back here in the, in the <laughs> choir. I agree. No, I'm talking about 1971. Maybe because I was watching it all the time on TV as a kid. Gene Wilder as Mr. Wonka. Jack Albertson as Grandpa Joe and Peter Ostrom as Charlie. And we're going to share with you now a scene with those three actors at the end of the film. Mr. Wonka, I am extraordinarily busy, sir. I just wanted to ask about the chocolate. The, the lifetime supply of chocolate for Charlie. When does he get it? He doesn't. Why not? Because he broke the rules. What rules? We didn't see any rules, did we, Charlie? Wrong, sir. Wrong. 
Under Section 37B of the contract signed by him, it states quite clearly that all offers shall become null and void if, and you can read it for yourself in this photostatic copy, I, the undersigned, shall forfeit all rights, privileges, and licenses herein and herein contained, etc., etc., fax mentis incendium gloria calpum, etc., etc., memo bis punitor delicatum. It's all there, black and white, clear as crystal. You stole fizzy lifting drinks. You bumped into the ceiling, which now has to be washed and sterilized, so you get nothing. You lose. Good day, sir. You're a crook. You're a cheat and a swindler. That's what you are. How can you do a thing like this? Build up a little boy's hopes and then smash all his dreams to pieces. You're an inhuman monster! I said good day! Come on, Charlie. Let's get out of here. I'll get even with him if it's the last thing I ever do. Slugworth wants a gobstopper. He'll get one. Mr. Wonka? So shines a good deed in a weary world. Charlie. My boy. You won! You did it! You did it! I knew you would! I just knew you would! Oh, Charlie. Forgive me for putting you through this. Please, forgive me. Come in, Mr. Wilkinson. Charlie, meet Mr. Wilkinson. Pleasure. Slugworth. No, no, that's not Slugworth. He works for me. For you? I had to test you, Charlie. And you passed the test. You won. What was? The jackpot, my dear sir. The grand and glorious jackpot. The chocolate? The chocolate, yes, the chocolate. But that's just the beginning. We have to get on. We have to get on. We have so much time and so little to do. Strike that. Reverse it. This way, please. <laughs> so shines a good deed in a weary world. That's what Mr. Wonka tells Charlie when he returns the everlasting gobstopper that he could have taken and sold to the competition and made millions. But Charlie's action, I think, summarizes what this parable is trying to tell us. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much. And that to this person will be entrusted true riches which Wonka does with Charlie when he gives him not only the lifetime supply of chocolate, but the entire factory. That's because Charlie chooses to be faithful with what has been given to him, which on the surface appears to be very little, a small piece of candy. But the end turns into true riches. Friends, whether it is much or little, we have been charged to be faithful with the gifts that God has given us. And I want to lift up that multiple generations have done that here at Foothills. Over 60 years ago, this property was an empty field here in a rural community. There's a photo, actually, of somebody with their donkey sitting right at the corner here. And those charter members invested their time and treasure and talents to build this church, the original sanctuary, which is now King Hall. And over the years, it has grown. The building of this sanctuary in the mid-'80s, the Faith Academy that has served thousands of preschoolers, now multiple generations, and now the Good Shepherd Ministry Center over the past five years to become 
one of the most important ministry and outreach centers in East County. And music programs and children and youth ministries and more missions than we can even count. We should pause and say thank you. Thank you that God has blessed this congregation richly and that generations of members have been faithful with those blessings. Now you might think that I might make a pitch right now for more giving. But guess what? I'm not. At least not today. In fact, there are plenty of opportunities coming up for you to give to the church. Dinner and auction on the 22nd, and the annual pledge campaign in November, special offering in Christmas and year end. But today, today let's just give thanks for what has already been given to us by God. And give thanks for the generosity that has created even greater opportunities for this church in the future. Amen. Indeed, we give thanks to God for the many blessings bestowed upon us, for our staff, for Linda and Marge, and our financial secretary, Diane, for their faithfulness in the stewarding of those gifts, and for all of you. We invite you to continue to be faithful in that. You may leave a check or payment in the basket in the narthex if you're with us in person, or you may contribute and give online in a variety of different ways. Let us meditate upon those blessings and give thanks as Chris plays for us now. Tell it to Jesus. Let us pray. God, we give thanks to you for your many blessings, both little and great, that fill our lives. And we know, O God, that you ultimately are the creator and giver and sustainer of all of these. Help us to be good stewards of them. Guide us as we follow Wesley's maxim to gain all we can, save all we can, and to give all we can so that we might continue to make your reign a reality in this world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us stand as you are able and conclude with the singing, our our closing hymn, There is a Balm in Gilead.
brothers and sisters, if you can't preach like Peter, if you can't pray like Paul, go and take the gifts that God has given you and give them generously to the world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.